Yes, yes, it is I, Lucifer Means Lightbringer, professor of silly costumes and mythical astronomy here at Lightbringer University, which is not a university. And I am here today with your monthly dose of A Song of Ice and Fire mythology. And as you can see, yes, I'm a Minnesota Vikings fan, which is why I've got this historically inaccurate horned helm. The Vikings did not, the actual Vikings did not wear horned helms, but pop culture has associated this thing and horned helms are... Gosh, they're a lot of fun. So you'll forgive me for wearing it for just a few moments. I'm not going to make you look at me like this the whole video. Don't worry. It's just a little fun costume. So friends, like I said, it's time for a bit of Norse mythology. Specifically, we're going to talk about the mythology connected to Odin and Yggdrasil. Now, there's actually an ungodly amount of Norse mythology woven into A Song of Ice and Fire, as many of you will know. For example, the very title itself, A Song of Ice and Fire, draws from Norse imagery of battles as songs and ice and fire as representing the sort of fundamental oppositional forces of the universe. So today, we'll just be looking at the ways in which Odin and Yggdrasil have been a primary source of inspiration for the character of Blood Raven and the Weirwood Trees, as well as the magical arts of skin changing and green seeing more broadly. We'll also look at the ways in which Bran Stark and Jon Snow are cast in the image of Odin as well, with Bran representing Odin's shamanistic tree wizard side and Jon embodying the berserker-like battle fury for which Odin is also quite famous. Now here's the thing, this turned into an hour and 45 minutes worth of video, so I went ahead and chopped it into three parts, which I'm releasing on consecutive days. This here is part one, which will tackle the Blood Raven stuff, Part two will be Bran, and part three will be John. Now, I've had a ton of fun making these, so I hope you'll enjoy all three. And for those of you who are experts in Old Norse language pronunciation, go easy on me. I really did try to do my best. Yeah, I'm still holding my drinking horn here. And you can also find a live stream on my page looking at the character of Brynden Rivers before he became a tree wizard under the Mythical Character Studies playlist, just to sort of round out our admiration and respect for Lord Bloodraven, who is, after all, always watching with a thousand eyes and one. Friends, the long and arduous journey that young Brandon Stark has to undertake to reach the secret cave of the three-eyed crow, or the three-eyed raven on the show, is not only a physical trek, but also something of a narrative journey, one that takes our aspiring young tree wizard away from the politics of King's Landing and the Game of Thrones, if you will, and off into the woods of magic and fantasy and, as it turns out, Norse mythology. Oh, and dead people. There are dead people aplenty in those woods. Now, by the time that Bran narrowly reaches the entrance to Blood Raven's Chamber of Secrets, things have already taken a noticeable turn for the weird. I mean, We've just recently met both the golden-eyed, claw-fingered children of the forest and cold hands, the talking ice zombie, if you will, to say nothing of the talking weirwood face slash doorway below the night fort known as the Black Gate, which is basically just a big mouth that you walk through. Okay, that's pretty weird. But as strange and spooky as all that is, we have to say that things get really and truly weird when we finally set eyes on the great Lord Bloodraven, a.k.a. Brendan Rivers, a.k.a. some grisly talking corpse, as Bran puts it. It's a definite, we're not in Kansas anymore moment, right? Like I'm not sure what Bran or the reader was expecting to find at the end of this long journey north, but it probably wasn't, you know, a half-dead person sort of rotting into the roots of the weirwood trees, hundreds of feet below the surface of the earth, in a pitch-black cave full of bones as we discover to be the case exactly in Bran's second chapter of A Dance with Dragons, when Bran meets Bloodraven for the first time. Before them, a pale lord in ebon finery sat dreaming in a tangled nest of roots, a woven weirwood throne that embraced his withered limbs as a mother does a child. His body was so skeletal and his clothes so rotted that at first Bran took him for another corpse, a dead man propped up so long that the roots had grown over him, under him, and through him. What skin the corpse lord showed was white, save for a bloody blotch that crept up his neck onto his cheek. His white hair was fine and thin as root hair and long enough to brush against the earthen floor. Roots coiled around his legs like wooden serpents. One burrowed through his breeches into the desiccated flesh of his thigh to emerge again from his shoulder. 
A spray of dark red leaves sprouted from his skull, and gray mushrooms spotted his brow. A little skin remained, stretched across his face, tight and hard as white leather, but even that was fraying, and here and there the brown and yellow bone beneath was poking through. Are you the three-eyed crow? Bran heard himself say. A three-eyed crow should have three eyes. He only has one, and that one red. Bran could feel the eyes staring at him, shining like a pool of blood in the torchlight. Where his other eye should have been, a thin white root grew from an empty socket, down his cheek and into his neck. I grow. The Pale Lord's voice was dry. His lips moved slowly, as if they had forgotten how to form words. Once I, black of garb and black of blood. The clothes he wore were rotten and faded, spotted with moss and eaten through with worms, but once they had been black. I have been many things, Bran. Now I am as you see me, and now you will understand why I could not come to you except in dreams. I have watched you for a long time, watched you with a thousand eyes and one. I saw your birth and that of your Lord Father before you. I saw your first step, heard your first word, was part of your first dream. I was watching when you fell, and now you are come to me at last, Brandon Stark, though the hour is late. Bran goes on to ask the nice desiccated talking tree man if he's going to heal Bran's legs, to which he answers no, further disappointing Bran. I mean, try to imagine how much of a bummer this entire thing is, right? When a wizard contacts you in dreams and charges you with a quest to a far-off land to become his magical pupil, you might expect to find him in a wizard's study in a magical castle somewhere, or perhaps in a hermit's cave high up on a sacred mountain. But this... This is like a nightmare hermit's cave. I mean, some freaky-deaky, highly suspect little elves led you down here. The cave is full of bones and corpses. And then one of the corpses starts rustling its leaves a bit and turns out to be not quite dead in the classic Monty Python sense. And, oh, actually, he'll be your teacher, Bran, so find a comfy spot and listen close. And by far the freakiest thing going on at this party is that the roots of the weirwood tree have grown through Blood Raven and sort of merged with his body. And we also learn later from Leaf, a child of the forest, that Lord Blood Raven drew his life from the tree and that he does not eat or drink. So the Weirwoods are feeding Lord Blood Raven, but also feeding off of him, slowly consuming him, both body and soul, as if the bloody, gaping mouths carved into the tree trunks above the ground weren't grisly enough. We just had to go and look under the trees and make things worse, huh? Now, our beloved author George R. R. Martin, who fancies himself a part-time horror writer, by the way, was apparently not 100% content that his first description of Blood Raven was sufficiently ghastly. So we took another bite at the apple in Bran's second chapter in the Weirwood Cave, which also comes from A Dance with Dragons. Seated on his throne of roots in the great cavern, half corpse and half tree, Lord Brendan seemed less a man than some ghastly statue made of twisted wood, old bone, and rotted wool. The only thing that looked alive in the pale ruin that was his face was his one red eye, burning like the last coal in a dead fire, surrounded by twisted roots and tatters of leathery white skin hanging off a yellowed skull. The sight of him still frightened Bran, the weirwood roots snaking in and out of his withered flesh, the mushrooms sprouting from his cheeks, the white wooden worm that grew from the socket where one eye had been. He liked it better when the torches were put out. In the dark, he could pretend that it was the three-eyed crow who whispered to him, and not some grisly talking corpse. One day, I will be like him. The thought filled Bran with dread, bad enough that he was broken with his useless legs. Was he doomed to lose the rest too, to spend all of his years with a weirwood growing in him and through him? All right, well, I think we've sufficiently conjured up some of the delightful je ne sais quoi of Blood Raven's weirwood cave, so let's try to figure out what the author is doing here and why he has wrought this arboreal horror on the estimable Lord Blood Raven. To put it simply, this is all about Odin or 
Odin, as we will say in the Old Norse pronunciation today. He is the Norse god of shamanism and many other things, like war, sovereignty, wisdom, magic, poetry, the dead. And of course, we're also going to be talking about Odin's magic tree of metaphors, Yggdrasil. Specifically, Bloodraven seems to be a cross of two residents of Yggdrasil, the first of which would be Odin himself. You see, in one very important tale, the one-eyed wizard god Odin hangs himself from the branches of Yggdrasil for nine nights in order to transcend death and see the runes, which empowers him with all kinds of magical abilities. Obviously, this compares very well to Bloodraven, who is a one-eyed wizard who transcends death by being sort of pinioned to his own magic tree. And of course, in some versions of Odin's hanging, or some depictions of his hanging, you can see that he's actually tied to the tree, more literally like Bloodraven. And of course, both Odin and Bloodraven are using their magic trees for astral projection, essentially, sending their spirits out into the astral plane. We'll go into this in a lot more detail in a second, of course, but the first thing is to see a half-dead, one-eyed, all-seeing, white-bearded wizard strung up in a magic tree and think, Odin. Now, there's one glaring important difference here. Odin is hung or tied to Yggdrasil up above the ground amongst the branches, while Bloodraven is in a cave down below the ground amongst the roots. That brings us to the second resident of Yggdrasil that Bloodraven is impersonating, and that would be the Nidhogger serpent, or dragon, because the same Norse word, omr, which means ensnaring serpent, is used for both serpent and dragon. The Nidhogger serpent is thought of as living amongst the roots of Yggdrasil, and most often the idea is that Nidhogger is actually imprisoned by the roots until the day of the apocalypse, which is Ragnarok, when it will be set free to wreak havoc along with all the other monsters of the cosmos. Bloodraven himself is, of course, a serpent, and that he's a dragon of House Targaryen, and Bloodraven is indeed physically imprisoned by the roots, pretty much exactly like Nidhogger. As a matter of fact, a speech of Odin recorded in the Grimnismal informs us that, quote, more serpents lie under Yggdrasil's ash than a witless fool would know. And then it goes on to name four more serpents, in addition to Nidhogger, that are living down there. Not only are these serpents slash dragons imprisoned by the roots, they're actually gnawing on the roots, ever lacerating as the translation goes. Martin conjures this atmosphere in the passage that we just read by telling us about the tangled nest of weirwood roots that the blood raven serpent sits in. Is this some kind of serpent's nest? Indeed, a couple of lines later we read that roots coiled around his legs like wooden serpents. This is a pretty clever way to evoke the idea of serpents among the roots without actually putting snakes down here, apart from Lord Brendan. And just as the serpents under Yggdrasil gnaw at its roots, here the serpent-like roots gnaw on Bloodraven, who is part of the tree, of course. Now, I've been saying that Nidhogger is trapped in the roots, sort of generically, but actually Yggdrasil has three roots, each of which anchor at a wellspring in three of the nine worlds of Norse cosmology. The Nidhogger dragon lives on the root, which reaches the realm called Nivelheim, which means world of mist, and is the realm of snow and ice. Aha! That's a pretty obvious parallel to Bloodraven's situation, right? Since his weirwood root cave is in the lands of always winter, which is definitely a realm of snow and ice, where the cold winds and the cold mist blow. We can further observe that Although there isn't one giant weirwood tree whose roots reach the entire world, the weirwood trees collectively do seem to constitute a network. That's the weirwood net, right? And they also may well physically connect to one another underground all throughout Westeros, or at least in certain patches of Westeros. But Bloodraven is a dragon specifically trapped amongst the weirwood roots in the land of snow and mist. That seems like a pretty good way to make us think of Niflheim and Nidhogger, and thus we get my conclusion that Bloodraven is essentially crossing Odin with Nidhogger. Ta-da! And finally, the word Nid, which is the root of Nidhogger, is a term for a social stigma which implies a loss of honor. And that kind of puts me in mind of Bloodraven being sent to the wall for the dishonorable killing of a Blackfire prince who was invited to King's Landing under a peace banner. Along those same lines, Odin considers himself above the law. I am above the law! Squeak! and thus feels free to flout the laws and customs of men, so Bloodraven sort of 
amoral, utilitarian philosophy, which gave him the reputation of being sinister and treacherous, is very likely to also have been inspired by the character of Odin. Odin don't give no f***s, basically. So it seems as though Martin is having a little fun here, crossing Odin with the serpent pinned down below Odin's tree. And the result is the grisly talking statue known as the Three-Eyed Crow, Targaryen, Dream Peeper Extraordinaire, and Resident of the Root Zone. Generally speaking, any sort of shamanic nature wizard that we might see in a fantasy story is likely to have drawn inspiration from Odin. Gandalf from Lord of the Rings certainly drew inspiration from Odin, and he's kind of the modern archetype for the fantasy wizard. And we can pretty much say the same thing for any sort of fantasy world magical tree which enables some sort of psychic ability or astral travel or enables secret knowledge. It's probably at least somewhat inspired by Yggdrasil. But as I hope you can see already, Blood Raven and his Weirwood have such specific ties to Yggdrasil-related mythology that we're essentially being told by the author that if we want to understand anything about the context of what we're seeing down in Blood Raven's cave, we must investigate Norse myth. And that's what we're going to do today, specifically the mythology of Odin and Yggdrasil, and we'll also have to look out for sneak attacks from berserkers, shape changers, and wargs, all of which issue forth from the woods of Norse mythology. Hey guys, post-production Viking mashup LML back here again, and just wanted to say real quick, if you like my Blood Raven voice and long in-depth videos that are so long they have to be cut into three videos about A Song of Ice and Fire mythology, then please consider supporting the channel through Patreon or PayPal at the links below the video. Thanks a lot to everyone subscribing to the channel of late. I've seen you guys uh, signing up. And if you're watching right now, please do click the subscription bell. Make sure it's set to all notifications because YouTube would rather use its horrible algorithm to decide which videos to show you and tell you about instead of honoring the choice you've very clearly already made by subscribing. Oh, okay, you get the idea. So thanks to everyone leaving comments, especially the Al Gore rhythm jokes. Those are the best. We've got Al Gore dancing like Kali herself as he warns us about the dangers of man, bear, pig. Sounds kind of like a warg, now that I think about it. So now let's get on with the show, so I can use Norse mythology to explain to you just why Bloodraven is being slowly eaten by a magical tree. Oh hey, uh, one more thing, guys. Along the way, I will occasionally be peppering you with some of the more than 200 nicknames for Odin as they apply to what we're talking about. For example, we just read two quotes about Blood Raven's red eye, right? One of which described it as burning like the last coal in a dead fire. While one of Odin's names is Beligir, which means flaming eye or shifty eyed. This is obviously related to the more widespread idea of the baleful eye, and you can see that word bale in Beligir, even if I'm mispronouncing it, sorry guys. And of course, the baleful eye, in turn, inspired George to create a ton of cool baleful eye symbolism tied to Azor High, Night's King, and the blotting out of the sun and moon, which are like the eyes of God. Anyways, check out Blood of the Other, A Baleful Bard, and A Promised Prince for all of my very extensive research on that. And shout out to Crow Food's daughter of the Disputed Lands, who also contributed very heavily to that research. Now, to me, the first thing to understand about Odin's influence on A Song of Ice and Fire is the principle of all magic having a cost, as that's an important theme in Odin's stories and George R. Martin's stories. Not one person in A Song of Ice and Fire escapes this law. Melisandre, Bloodraven, Bran, Daenerys, original Azor Ahai, they all have to sacrifice and sacrifice in payment for the magic that they wield. And this principle is a hallmark of Odin mythology. I mean, I'd even go so far as to say that George Martin seems more interested in writing about the dire costs that people pay to obtain and use magic as opposed to the sheer fantasy awesomeness of magic itself. Now, Odin has two stories pertaining to gaining magical power through Yggdrasil, and both of them have him paying a heavy price. Let's start with the hanging, which I've already alluded to. Someone was recently talking to me on Twitter about my pronunciation and familiarity with Norse myth, good-naturedly, of course, so let me just go ahead and just read this bit from the Havamal in Old Norse, as well as English. Vet ek at ek hek, vindga me the o, natr a larniu, geri undada, o kevin odni, silver silvumer, 
their son Avrotum Ren. Big hat tip here to Dr. Jackson Crawford, professor of Norse myth and languages, holder of a PhD in Scandinavian, author of The Wanderer's Havamal, and many other things, whose pronunciations I have copied here as best I could. He's now teaching everyone for free about all things Norse myth and languages on his YouTube channel, which is called Jackson Crawford, so be sure to check that out. I'm also very happy to report that Unlike some people talking about Norse mythology on the internet, Dr. Jackson Crawford has no ties to white supremacy and even took the time to make a very clear statement on his channel denouncing those who would misuse Norse myth for those purposes. Which I also hereby make, I don't like white supremacy either, not at all. And I'm similarly disgusted with their attempted claim to Norse mythology. Norse myth and philosophy is well worth studying. It's lovely and intricate and complex, just like all world mythology. So we certainly won't be scared off from discussing it by those creeps, but I did want to say that very clearly. Anyway, that lovely bit of Old Norse translates to... I know that I hung on a wind-rocked tree nine whole nights with a spear wounded and to Odin offered myself to myself on that tree of which no one knows from what roots it springs. The most confusing part here is definitely the riddle of Odin sacrificing himself to himself. I mean, what does that mean, right? Well, the meaning is twofold, as I understand it. First, the deepest meaning of the myth is one of personal transformation. Odin is sacrificing his lower self, his base desires, to awaken his higher self. Open his third eye, if you will. He's sacrificing his old self to give birth to his new self. He's sacrificing his physical self to awaken his spiritual potential. These are all fairly similar ideas, right? It's self-improvement by self-sacrifice, in other words. This is a basic principle of pretty much all spiritual practices, as well as all self-improvement books, and all of our grandparents' adages about Hard work and sacrifice being the only way to earn something worth having, you know? Huh? Back in my day. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just kidding. I love you, Pop Pop. That's actually my Pop Pop's tie right there. And these are his uh, Aegis pins because he was in the Navy and helped design the Aegis anti missile defense systems. Anyway, uh, yes, the idea of magic always coming at a heavy cost is simply an extension of this basic principle into the realm of the supernatural, right? And of course, anyone who's read A Song of Ice and Fire knows that Martin has specifically implemented the idea of magical transformation through death and rebirth. We've seen that with characters like Beric, Lady Stoneheart, Cold Hands, and most importantly, Jon Snow, who's in dire need of resurrection and magical power to fight the others. These long nine or ten years, whatever it's been that he's been laying in the snow. And then, of course, we have Daenerys, whose miraculous hatching of the dragons was couched in the language of death, rebirth, and transformation. So that's the first part of the riddle of Odin sacrificing himself to himself. And the weirder part is that Yggdrasil is actually more than Odin's tree, but sometimes is considered a part of Odin himself. One of Odin's epithets was Sigrunar, which means victory tree, showing that Odin himself can be a tree, as well as Runi Vargna, which means mover of constellations, which is a perfect description of the basic function of the very idea of a cosmic world tree. It's the celestial axis around which the constellations seem to turn. Then when we break down the word Yggdrasil, we find that Yggr, which means terrible one, is actually a name for Odin. And Drasil means horse or gallows. The reason why a horse can be synonymous with a gallows, those two things don't sound the same, right? Well, it's because the gallows in days of yore were often called the horse of the hanged because the hanged man rides the gallows like a horse. It's pretty dark humor, but they don't call it the Dark Ages for nothing, right? Anyway, Yggdrasil is therefore commonly translated as Odin's horse and is essentially Odin's tree. And therefore, therefore... Odin sacrificing himself to Yggdrasil can be thought of as sacrificing himself to himself. Now, Bloodraven mimics all of these ideas wonderfully, you'll note. Even before physically and mentally merging with the weirwood trees, he actually looked like a walking weirwood tree with his bone-white skin and hair and blood-red eye and facial birthmark. 
Blood Raven himself is a symbol of a weirwood tree and then becomes a weirwood tree, in other words. Now, there's one other layer to Odin's self sacrifice, which has to do with Odin being seen as Lord of the Dead. When a foe was killed in battle, particularly with a spear, it was said that they were given to Odin. Therefore, Odin was sacrificing himself to himself in the sense that he was giving himself over to death and doing so in part with his spear, Gungnir. Now, why did Odin do this horrible thing? Well, he had heard tell of a system of magic which he, the god of magic and shamanism, did not have power over, and Odin, ever hungry for magic power, was determined to rectify that. This magic system was that of the runes, which serve both as an alphabet and also as a collection of symbols that can be used to give access to the magical concepts that they represent. For example, a warrior going into battle might carve runes of protection or strength or ferocity onto the haft of his axe or his shield or on his armor. A Viking sailor might carve runes of safety, calm seas, safe travel, that kind of thing into the side of their boat. And most famously, the three Norns carve runes into the trunk of Yggdrasil to determine the fates of men, which seems a likely parallel to the carving of the faces on the weirwood trees as some part of empowering men to use their magic. Now, to gain the power of the runes, you have to prove yourself worthy of them. You can't just grab them up, right? And they have to reveal themselves to you. So this is what led Odin to perform the excruciating sacrifice to himself. Here are the next lines of the Havamal. They did not gladden me with a loaf or a horn. I peered down, I took up the runes, screaming I took them. Again, I fell from there. Essentially, Odin is thought of as hovering between life and death for those nine long nights, without food or water or mead, peering down into the depths of the wellsprings below Yggdrasil. Then, when his agony had reached its absolute peak, the runes manifest themselves, and with a scream that shakes up the world, one of his nicknames is the Screamer, Odin falls from the tree and seizes up the runes, gathering their many magical powers. With the rune magic, Odin is indeed the most powerful god of the cosmos, and his mastery of Yggdrasil establishes him as essentially lord of the nine realms, which are anchored by Yggdrasil. Odin is therefore called Runatir, which means god of runes, as well as many variations of him as a hanged god, such as god of the hanged, lord of the hanged, the hanged one, Gallows Burden, and even Visitor of the Hanged. It's pretty easy to see the correlation to Blood Raven here, right? He's been hovering between life and death for years now, tied to the tree and, in fact, pierced through with the weirwood roots, very like Odin was pierced with a spear. And even better, Odin's spear, and indeed most Viking spears, are made from ash wood, the type of tree that Yggdrasil is. So in a sense, Odin was pierced by the wood of his own tree, just like Blood Raven. Now, instead of the rune magic of Yggdrasil, Bloodraven has gained access to the entire library of knowledge contained in the Weirwoodnet Greenseer Hivemind. And instead of the nine worlds tethered to Yggdrasil, Bloodraven gains access to the River of Time, as he puts it, which flows around the Weirwoods. And that essentially means that he can peep into any part of history and pretty much just have a look, like a virtual DVR button for all of reality. So even though Bloodraven is living down among the roots, like the Nidhogger Serpent, he's very definitely playing the role of highly knowledgeable tree wizard, or in other words, Odin. All right, well, all that hanging and strangulation has made me a little hot under the collar. I don't know about you. I'm just gonna... Get a little more comfortable here. We're going back up north soon, so I'll, I'm sure I'll need the sweater soon, but uh, here we go. The other story about Odin's willingness to perform very grisly self-sacrifice in order to obtain magical knowledge and power is, of course, his very famous drink from the Well of Mimir. Now, there's no complete direct account of this event, only references to it having happened, so there's not a terrible lot of detail. But the basics of the story are pretty well known. You guys are probably familiar with it, right? Odin must sacrifice one of his eyes to get a drink from the Fountain of Wisdom known as Mimisbrunner, which means Mimir's well. Mimisbrunner is one of those three well springs that Yggdrasil's roots tap into, and it's found in Jotunheimr, the land of the Jotnar, which, like Nivelheim, is a land of ice and snow. There's lots of ice and snow in Norse mythology. In any case, Mimir, the guardian of the well, 
He guzzles from it every day with the Jalarhorn and is therefore super smart. Now, Odin is at least smart enough to know of the well and to journey through the lands of the Jatnar to drink from it. Though again, the price of this wisdom was spooning out his eye, which he then had to toss into the well. And yeah, I think people still kept drinking from it, even with Odin's bloody eyeball floating in there, which is pretty gross. This passage is from the poetic Oedipoem Voluspa, and is spoken by a Volva, which is a shamanic seeress. Of what wouldst thou ask me? Why temptest thou me? O oh, then, I know all, where thou thine eye didst sink in the pure well of Mimir. Mimir drinks from me to every morn from Valfather's Blanche. Yeah, those last two lines actually do mean that Mimir drinks from the well with all father's pledge, meaning his eye, floating around in there. So, yikes. Anyway, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't really get hung up on that kind of thing with Norse myth. And once again, it's easy to see the parallels to Bloodraven, right? Although the Jatnar aren't actually giants, the word is often translated as frost giants. You guys have probably heard that. And so we can see that Bloodraven's journey into a cold land filled with giants to find a cave where he can obtain magical knowledge is indeed very similar to Odin's journey to reach Mimisbrunner. Bloodraven's cave does have water in it in the form of a black river that they can hear rushing far below their cavern chamber, though I'm not sure if anyone drinks from it. Well, I don't know, maybe the children scuttle all the way down there with little buckets to retrieve water, who knows? I was thinking they probably drank the snow melt, but... Anyways, more important is the fact that there's a metaphorical spring down here in the Bloodraven cave. Jojen, ever the poet, describes the green seer gift by saying, It is given to a few to drink of that green fountain whilst still in mortal flesh, to hear the whisperings of the leaves, and see as the trees see, as the gods see. Aha, so it's a green fountain they drink from down here. This metaphor is surely chosen by the author to evoke the idea of Mimir's well. Although there's a little bit of a consistency issue, we are probably also meant to draw a comparison between the magical, mind-expanding waters of Mimir's well, and the significantly chunkier weirwood paste slurry, see its consistency difference, that the green seers like Bran and presumably Bloodraven must eat, drink, slurp down, I don't know how you want to say it, in order to wed the weirwood trees and awaken their powers. Yum, I know, and if you want to be thoroughly grossed out, make sure you watch my Jojen paste video over a nice warm bowl of porridge, or maybe some soggy cereal, the point is that whether we're talking about green seers consuming weirwood paste or drinking from a metaphorical green fountain, we can see that the theme of Mimir's well is at work here, because wetting the trees involves tremendous physical sacrifice. You don't have to spoon out your eye as Odin did, although you may have to spoon up a bit of your friend mashed into a paste, but more obviously becoming a living tree corpse is essentially sacrificing your entire physical body to gain magical power. And that's definitely the same concept. Sacrifice your physical eye to open up your third eye. Sacrifice your lower self to awaken your higher self. Become physically tethered to the trees so that your spirit can fly and roam the cosmos. At the end of the day, Odin's stories and the Green Seer lifestyle send the same messages. Next week on Lifestyles of the Dead and Rotting. Now, Blood Raven actually lost his eye before coming to the Weirwood Cave. The root didn't just one day sort of burrow into it. He lost it while he was fighting the Battle of Redgrass Field, and he lost it at the hands of his half-brother, Agor Rivers, a.k.a. Bittersteel. There's not a ton to say about that, really, except that Odin was one of three Norse gods who oversaw aspects of war and was quite fond of battle, and that's a severe understatement, as we'll discuss. So it's kind of just good to see Bloodraven getting out of the house a bit and doing some battle stuff like Odin did. Oh, and one final note on Mimir, uh, the, the person Mimir. He gets his head cut off during a great battle, and Odin ends up preserving the head and carrying it around so it can talk to him and whisper secrets to him, which it does. This seems a lot like Blood Raven and the Green Seers being able to tap into the wisdom of the dead souls inside the weirwood trees, which look like decapitated heads that became tree trunks. And this is also just kind of cool, so I had to mention it. Mimir's sons dance, but the fate tree kindles at the resounding Jalarhorn. Loud blows Heimdallar, his horn is aloft, and Odin speaks with Mimir's head. 
Yggdrasil shivers, the ash as it stands. The old tree groans, and the giant slips free. A song of ice and fire indeed. Hey there, friends. It's post-production LML. Non-canonically horny post-production LML. Again, the Vikings didn't wear horned helmets. Don't kill me in the comments. I'm a Vikings fan. I get to wear the stupid hat. I'm a professor of silly costumes. Don't question my authority. Anyways, we're not done talking about Lord Bloodraven by a long shot. However, it is time to shift the focus over to young Bran Stark and the ways in which he's manifesting Odin symbolism and mythology. That means it's time for Odin Origins Part 2. Bran Stark, which is either coming out tomorrow for those of you watching this video hot off the presses, or appearing on your screen below shortly. And don't forget part three, which will talk about Jon, skin changing, warging, going berserk with Odin-like battle fury, and of course there's probably also going to be a live stream to follow by the time all these videos are out. So thank you very much everyone leaving comments, and thank you most of all to our patron sponsors who make all of this possible.